Grant, Lord, that I may speak not with plausible words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of your Spirit's power through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, the skins are in the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. That gives them a shot at the Super Bowl. No? <laughs> I mean, just imagine that. How long has it been? And if, if they actually went to the Super Bowl, well, then I'd have to watch it for more than just the advertising. And for years, that's pretty much been the only reason why I watch the Super Bowl. I mean, I, you know, I, like, the, I like the Redskins. And, but that's the extent of my interest in football, for the most part. But the Super Bowl ads, I mean, that's something worth tuning in for, just for the fun, the interest. You get to see the biggest brands and the hottest talent in advertising combine with lots and lots of money to hawk their wares to the biggest marketplace, three-hour marketplace in the world. You get to, it's like the Super Bowl of advertising. They want to cement their logo. They want to, they want to, Put that vision in the minds of as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. I mean, how long are those ads? 30 seconds? And for that, they'll pay outrageous sums of money, the most expensive 30 seconds in the world. Now, we start a new season in the church today. It's the Feast of the Epiphany. And think of this year's epiphany. It's a short one because Easter is very early this year. Think of it as a series of six Super Bowl ads for Jesus, the epiphany. Raising his profile, cementing his brand in the minds of multitudes. And the Magi's visit is the first spreading Jesus' fame throughout Palestine because it doesn't show up in Matthew as much, but in the other gospel, um, it says that, you know, once Herod heard, oh, the Messiah, then all of a sudden everybody in the court, everybody in Jerusalem, everybody in Judea is like, the Messiah. <laughs> because Easter, I mean, because the birth of Jesus was just announced to shepherds. I mean, it was a very low-key affair. Jesus' fame is spreading in Palestine. Jesus' fame is spread like to the east, out to Persia. They see the star and they come. In Epiphany, Christ is advertised to the world. And we see that, we see how in each of the texts we have this morning. Isaiah, Matthew, Paul, each portray Jesus' epiphany from their own perspective, all right? And I'd like to just take a brief look at each uh, with you today. So there's Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 60. It's just, it's a beautiful passage. It's, it echoes in our ears. We've heard it before somewhere, right? <laughs> he was preaching over 500 years before Jesus. He's looking ahead to the future. He's a prophet. He sees a time in which the glory of God is going to shine in the world. It's going to be visible. And he says, nations will come to that light. Kings to the brightness of that dawning. You almost hear that in Handel's Messiah, right? The Super Bowl advertisers would salivate at such a market. Isaiah tells us 
tells the people, he says, lift up your eyes and look around and see the multitude of the nations coming to worship the God of Israel. And they're bringing their wealth with them as an offering. There's camel caravans from the deserts. There's ships of Tarshish, like fleets of merchant craft from the sea, bringing gifts of gold and frankincense. And that gold is exactly what those Super Bowl advertisers are after. They want the gold. Isaiah envisions a sensation that sweeps the planet. It literally changes the world. It reorients the nations from the worship of idols in darkness to the worship of the true God. Now, in Isaiah's day, God's salvation, God's worship, all this God stuff didn't extend much farther than ethnic Israel. (laughs) A little tiny circle, a little tiny postage stamp of land that at that time was had actually it was hanging by a thread about to be eradicated gone from history it was so close and so this vision is i mean it's really kind of hard to imagine <laughs> It's inconceivable. But Isaiah sees the day when the nations will come from near and far to see the glory of God. Isaiah sees a marketing coup of stupendous dimensions. It's big. Bigger than Microsoft, Nike, Raymond James, you know, you got the Raymond James Stadium. Much bigger than they ever dreamed of being. So now, fast forward several hundred years to Matthew. And he shows us the beginning fulfillment of what Isaiah saw. It's begun. And he picks up on this imagery to describe the events that followed the birth of Jesus. Now, You oftentimes will see uh, imagery of Jesus' nativity. I'm pointing to the nativity scene that we had here. And the kings are there in Bethlehem in the stall, the barn with the birth of Jesus. No, no, uh, they came later. They came to a house, Matthew tells us. So after the birth of Jesus, his star appears, and months later, Maybe even years later, the Magi came. That's why when Herod had the children killed, it was all the kids under three. So months, years later, they show up. Jesus' birth didn't receive a whole lot of coverage. Shepherds, that was it. Kind of a low-key affair. But then that star begins to shine brightly. The glory appears, as Isaiah said, a light in the darkness. That star was an epiphany, far more iconic than the Goodyear blimp over the stadium. An epiphany. The publicity has begun. The word is spreading. And far to the east, probably in Persia, the three magi, who are schooled in the arts of astrology. They're they're gifted at observing the motions of the stars. They recognize that star for what it is. And they gather their gifts. They load up their camel caravan. They begin the long journey across the Arabian desert to Palestine. And maybe these magi had been influenced by Jews who were in Persia during that time of exile. They had heard the story of Isaiah 
and they incorporated that into their study of the stars. Who knows? They follow the star to Jerusalem where they stop to ask directions from Herod. You see how the news is spreading here? Herod learns of Christ's birth and now all Jerusalem is talking about it. So in these three exotic figures, the Magi, Isaiah's vision is coming to pass. The kings of the earth are indeed coming to the Messiah. They're bringing their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, just as Isaiah said. And this is just the beginning. Throughout his whole ministry, Jesus hinted at the international scope of his kingdom, his work, his mission. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he urges his apostles to make disciples of all the nations. Go out there and get them, guys, and make disciples. They did. Which brings us now to Paul, our, gospel, or our epistle reading. This, pa- this passage from his letter to the Ephesians. He speaks of how the epiphany of Christ impacted his own life. Jesus' manifestation to the world gave him a mission in life. He called it Apostle to the Gentiles. I guess he could put that on the back of his jersey, right? Apostle to the Gentiles. It's like Paul has become Jesus' vice president for marketing. And he defines his job description. He says, my job is to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ. That's his message. I'm sure he had his elevator speech ready. His goal? Make everyone see. He did this by proclaiming the Christian faith by his words, by his example, to everyone he came in contact with. And we know that Paul was a tent maker, right? So Paul did not have a fancy outfit like I have. He didn't have a, uh, a special vocation, a title. He went around every city of the Roman Empire that he could reach, and he set up his stall in the marketplace And he sat there and he sewed tents and tarps and other large outdoor cloth coverings. And uh, people would come around and they would negotiate. He would custom make tents, uh, awnings, whatever. Outdoor upholstery for somebody's veranda. He would make this stuff for his customers. And he would share with them the news of Jesus. And then on Sabbath day, he would go to the local synagogue. And because he was one of the best trained rabbis of his day, he'd say, uh, hey, can I speak? He'd warp out his little clergy credentials. And he uh, would then proclaim Jesus in the synagogue. And then usually, oftentimes, he'd be forced out for that. And then a crowd would form, like, what's this big hubbub at the synagogue? And then he'd have this crowd of Gentiles, and he'd start preaching to them. He used every means at his disposal. And then once they got, oftentimes, he'd get beaten up, cast out of the city. He'd go back, sneak back in, gather his stuff, pack up his stall, and head to the next city. Sometimes he would have, he'd be able to stay. He'd baptize new believers into Jesus. He would teach them how to follow Jesus. He stayed in some cities for a couple of years, gathering a community, helping them Believe and love one another, helping them serve their neighbors, 
helping them proclaim the, the news of Jesus. And he established Christian communities like that all over the Roman world. And like yeast in the dough, these communities spread throughout the empire. And after three centuries, the Emperor Constantine, you know, he kind of saw where the wind was blowing, and he figured that he better bow before Jesus as well, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Emperor Constantine himself bowed before Jesus and then led the final steps of the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christ. And the wealth and power of the empire was turned to building the church. Just like Isaiah said. Wow. Wow. And the gospel has continued to grow and spread throughout the world ever since. And here we are today. Though we are but a couple handfuls, socially distanced, all masked up, and hey, you all in our virtual congregation, great to have you all here. Um, Though we are few, we are many in the world today. We are among more than one-third of the human population that bows before Jesus as Lord. And since World War II, Christianity has spread farther and faster than at any other time in history. It has become the first, the world's first global faith with indigenous Christian communities in every nation, among every people group on earth. And it's helpful to remember that as you witness and worry about things like political fear and loathing in Washington, as you worry about our country, Don't let politics swallow up your attention, okay? We worship the Messiah. And we offer all that we have to him alone. Like the Magi, we open up our treasure chests of our lives. We offer our time, our talent, our treasure to God. And the key point here is that this is how Christ is made manifest today. This is the epiphany today. In the world today, it's you all. It's us. It's his church. We manifest him to the world. So on the Feast of Epiphany, on the, as we celebrate the baptism of our Lord, our identity, our mission in the shadow of the nation's capital, is very clear. We pledge ourselves anew to it in the baptismal covenant. Christ has come into the world, and he has manifested through you, through your faithfulness, through our community, through our witness, through our advertising, before our neighbors. We are his Super Bowl ad. So happy epiphany, folks. And may God make us, both as a community of Christians and individually members of it, a light that others can see. In troubled times, we need to be the light. Amen.